So ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this second and the last day of this conference. I hope you had a good stay in the night. There's a lot of work late evening, which I'm sure your teams have completed. I kept getting mails late night. Uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker today, Professor Mark Russell. True to the tradition that I started yesterday, I'll not read out the full biodata. Suffice it to say that Professor Russell has been in higher education since 1996. He's from King's College, London. Like many of us, he's an engineer, so we note that with pleasure. <laughs> uh, he is the head of the Center for Technology Enhanced Learning, the King's College. But what struck me as most important is he is known not for the use of technology enhanced learning, but a thoughtful use of technology enhanced learning. And that, I think, is a, is a great objective. We admire you for that. You're most welcome, sir. Well, thank you very much, Professor, and thank you very much for inviting me to offer a few thoughts from, I guess, I guess those number of years that I've been working in higher education, first as an engineering academic, and I was told to make the case that I am an engineering academic. I was told that would warm me slightly to your heart because engineering is so very prevalent here. And I have to say, unfortunately, it's a, it's a dwindling profession back in the UK, so it's so heartening to see you talk so passionately about engineering here. So thank you to Manjula and Jill for inviting me from the British Council and of course the Ministry and colleagues at the IIT for making this such an outstanding event. I've been super looked after, I've had a wonderful day yesterday and I've learnt lots and I'll be taking lots back with me. So thank you for that and congratulations on securing such a, such a fab event. I'm going to share with you some of my thinking around technology enhanced learning and I think some of the opportunities that exist in front of you. I suspect you know some of these opportunities, if not all of these opportunities already. But also just add a cautionary tale as well to those opportunities and say that this, quite frankly, brave and bold venture that your country is, is engaging in is not without challenge. So I'm just underscoring some of those opportunities with some of what I see as some of the challenges around technology-enhanced learning. Um, so Mark Russell, engineer by background, I've been working in higher education since 1996 and more recently the last five or ten years I've been looking after technology-enhanced learning in institutions. And I'm currently at King's College London which is a large research intensive institution at the heart of London in the UK. So let's start with some positives and think about what the opportunities are for technology enhanced learning. And I'm going to march you through some opportunities, some challenges, and then I will just conclude with a story of my journey here. So the opportunities that technology enhanced learning brings are clearly to harvest and share resources. And that was obvious to me yesterday that you were tuned into much of this. A number of you spoke about the MIT courseware, open courseware project. Um, a number of you spoke about the Khan Academy, some fab resources that are there for you and I to engage with. There are, of course, a whole host of other repositories available for you. In the UK, we have something called Joram, where academics are invited to post any resources that they think other academics and other members of the academy might benefit from. YouTube presents a wonderful opportunity to share our resources as well. There's one of my engineering simulations in YouTube here with the UH logo. And of course, the iTunes University site, iTunes U, provides yet another opportunity for the busy academic to share and use other resources that other colleagues have considered. And I suspect that iTunes U presents another shop front for our institutions as well for colleagues looking in. I suppose what I'd want you to do is not just think about providing resources, but also take the opportunity to use some of those resources that others have used, because I'm not sure we need to write too much more about the first law of thermodynamics, quite frankly, 
there's probably enough stuff already out there about the first law of thermodynamics. Our job as engaging educators should be to draw on that stuff that's already out there and make sense for it and put it into context with the people that we are trying to teach. So it's less about the creation of those resources and more about the thoughtful integration of those resources into our curricula. So there's the first opportunity, but again underscoring the introduction which was about my thoughtful use of technology is the fact that we must think about curriculum design too. So good curricula obviously is not just about a collection of stuff or a bunch of resources. It's the ways in which we weave those resources together. It's the story that we create around those resources to engage and infuse and of course assess our students through those resources. So resources are a very helpful starting point in thinking about our curricula. The second opportunity that technology enhanced learning brings to us is the significant potential it brings to us as educators to enhance and extend our more traditional classroom interactions. And I saw that yesterday through colleagues talking about the virtual classrooms. I saw that yesterday when I was hearing you talking about bringing Skype into the classroom. I saw that yesterday when I heard you talking about using your managed learning environments for formative assessments, for quizzing, for engaging students in pre-reading, for engaging students in dialogue both before and after the lecture. So it gives us a wonderful opportunity to make more of the space we have together both beforehand and after and of course in different domains. So it extends our spatial connections and it extends our connections in the time domain as well. And I've just put another couple of examples up there which actually I don't think I saw too much of yesterday. Um, Second Life and other virtual worlds present some good opportunities for immersive education in simulated spaces. And some work that was supported by the Microsoft Research Foundation was some work at Washington State University on Classroom Presenter. Now I saw the fab fabulous work going on with your tablets. Here's something that was done in the mid-2000s, I think, 2005. Classroom Presenter at Washington State was allowing students to interact with each other and their lecturer or their faculty member through Digital Inc. So that's another really smart piece of free software that might be part of your armory. And again, no doubt with generous support from Microsoft Research Foundation. So it means that we can do more with what we have here. And I wonderfully heard a number of you talk about the flipped classroom, something that I think is taking over much of our thinking around education. So great to see some of that. And no doubt you're already tuned into this potential. One of the things that I'm particularly interested in doing, though, is making sense of some of those words and some, some of those opportunities. And with colleagues back at King's College London, what I'm working on now is helping colleagues or help faculty <coughs> members understand the consequences of their curriculum design on student engagement. So what I have here is... Um, just as a very simple axis. So on the x-axis I have days of the week, Monday through one week cycle and then on to Tuesday. And on the y-axis I have something that I've been purposely vague about. It's either engagement, interest or learning. I can put no numbers to that I'm afraid, but I'm sharing this with you for the first time. So I'm wanting to contemplate the notions of engagement, interest or learning versus day of the week. The arrows are highlighting two lectures. So they are pointing to two circles. They are purposely that small because they represent on that time domain the attention that we can grab with our students. They are two hour lectures. They are two two hour lectures. That's what those red arrows are highlighting, the yellow circles. And I might conjecture that if a student is exposed to that pedagogic pattern, two two-hour lectures, 
that's possibly what their engagement, interest or learning profile is going to look like. They're going to do nothing, I suspect, or start thinking about the lecture. Then their profile is going to peak during the lecture, hopefully. Then it's going to dwindle. There might be a little bit of noise or there might be a little bit of engagement as they think about things or talk to their peers. And then it spikes again at the following week's lecture. Now, I know that there will be a different profile for each student. So essentially, we can now start to create a three-dimensional engagement interest learning landscape of different individuals. So the blue candidate at the front of that image represents somebody that actually only ever tunes in during the lectures and doesn't do any thinking outside, whereas the purple candidate towards the back of the image is actually fairly constantly thinking about and working around that lecture. But I'd like to conjecture that that pedagogic pattern, two discrete and unconnected lectures, simply creates two peaks with some noise or other during the, during the course of those interactions. And so what we're trying to do now at King's College London is help people understand the consequences of blended learning design or flipped classroom design or just-in-time teaching on students' engagement, interest and learning. And so just simply by adding a quiz that follows the lecture, and the quiz is the blue dot with the red arrow looking back, so it's a quiz that reflects back on the lecture, the following day, the green, let me just quickly point to it here, this is the original profile. I think if students know they've got a quiz that follows the lecture, no doubt they will tune in and gain more from that lecture experience. So you immediately get more interest, engagement and learning during the lecture. And then I suspect the quiz actually stimulates yet more engagement, interest and learning. And by simply thoughtfully connecting those interactions, we lift the area under the, or the area under the curve becomes greater and so we have achieved more interest, engagement and learning. And of course, it will be of little surprise that we are developing some of those engagement, interest, learning landscapes for a whole series of different interactions. And we're not doing them as discrete entities, we're actually helping colleagues make thoughtful choices about their whole curriculum design, stimulated by technology, and just seeing how technology can add more to those classroom interactions. And so when you think about what I've just described now, Clearly, it's giving us an opportunity to either nudge colleagues to think about curricula or, better still, in some cases, force a complete rethink about their pedagogic values and beliefs and, indeed, their teaching strategies. Somebody said yesterday, the fact that we are teaching does not mean that students learn. We should hang on to that thought. So, but what we can do as good educators is try to strengthen the link between our teaching and our students' learning. And so it's important that we do come back to the literature around what we need to do to create meaningful learning spaces. And if I encourage you to read one other thing, if you haven't already come across the work of John Bransford, How People Learn, it took the state by storm a few years back. I'm offering that to you because that was a free book on the internet and I suspect it is free now. And it has brought psychologists, those from the learning scientists together, as well as educators together to understand and pr present a coherent argument of the things we need to do to create an environment in which learning can flourish. So how people learn, John Bransford from Washington University, Washington State I believe, something around what good pedagogy might look like, and then, of course, some other helpful texts around technology-enhanced learning, of which there are numerous others. Anoop pointed to the study of John Hake, of, of Hake, I beg your pardon, and the work around the ways in which, if we engage students differently in our lectures, how much the learning gains improve, and Eric Mazur has done some incredible work around that as well. So the text on the far right-hand side, peer instruction, is helpful as is the work of Gregor Novak and Just-In-Time Teaching. 
I actually think these texts are the forerunner to our thinking around the flipped classroom. So they are well worth a skim if you haven't come across them already. So, I understand it's important for me to stop from time to time and ask you or invite you to think about what I've been saying. So here's the, my one thing for you to do. I might only ask you to do one thing. If you were to do one thing after this event, and I might be greedy and frame it around my presentation, of course, it might be to invite you to take a fresh look at what you're doing in the context of what you've been thinking about and what you've been hearing about yesterday and no doubt what you'll be hearing about today. So the things that you are doing and have responsibility for and ask yourself, is it working? Is it supported by the literature and evidence? And have you suitably, and I put in brackets there, but gently, sometimes we need to be gentle when we're encouraging others, have you gently shared it for others to benefit from? One thing that astounds me about higher education is our immense ability to keep secrets. We do some brilliant, brilliant things in our classrooms, but we just sometimes forget to tell our others about it. And if we're serious about moving the academy and learning forward, we do need to take those opportunities to share our work. So there's my thing for you to think about, and I would say, as an underscore, PS, make sure you have a good definition of, is it working? Because if you're going to share that with your colleagues, they'd want to know what that means, and they'd want to hear your evidence for it. And if you want to work outside of engineering, what works for us is very different from colleagues in other disciplines as well. I don't understand why they would have a different narrative around what it's working than us engineers, but apparently they do, and there are different epistemological beliefs. So their understanding of evidence is different from ours. So that's my one thing for you. Just marching on them with these opportunities, TELL presents fantastic opportunities to build additional connections. I mean, of course we have connected here over the last day and of course we will continue to connect. But I'm now able to connect with technology and technology enhanced learning with other educators, with other students that I'm never ever going to see in my lifetime and tune into some of their thinking and share some conversations with. And we can do that through Twitter, through LinkedIn, through Facebook, through a whole host of social and professional media that is emerging and continues to be pervasive. And I know this came up on a number of occasions yesterday, but I think this is one of the real benefits of technology enhanced learning is it's not actually asking or inquiring us to technologize what we already do. I think it's got the real potential to actually force us as an academy to look again at what and why we do things. And that's certainly been what I think this MOOC initiatives and these Spock in initiatives have all been about. And I think in some institutions this is such shaking their very foundations because it's now saying, do we really need to be here? Is education going to be, I guess, or are we going to engage our students differently three or five years <coughs> hence? And here is our first MOOC on the Future Learn platform that is in its second week now. So, not while I'm talking, of course, but if you want to tune into Future Learn, you'll see Dr. Carl Dyer from the world renowned Institute of Psychiatry at King's College London talking about drugs and drugs addiction. And what it does is these MOOC platforms just allow us to engage with experts that we would never have had an opportunity to engage with. And I might just pause here and say, so we've talked about technology enhanced learning. Sometimes we come back to ICT. And I might now want to ask, well, what is ICT? I mean, the forerunner to this was IT, of course. It was simply information technology. But is ICT information and communication technologies? Is it as I have implied, although not explicitly stated, information and collaborative technologies? Or is it actually information and connective technologies? 
Is that what we are seeing now with ICT and where we're going? I have a view on what I think it's doing and, what, and, and its potential, and it's certainly towards the bottom of that list. Actually, what about this for a model? Why don't, let's stop ICT. Why don't we call it the PC squared T4P squared? That's much more catchy, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, perhaps not. Maybe not, and it is, of course, a tease, but it better helps us understand what I think we are trying to do with ICT. I think it is about a personalised, collaborative and connective technology for pedagogic purposes. I'll remind you again, that is a tease by the way, the PC squared T4P squared model, but I think it's helpful that we forget about information technology as being about transmission and we forget about education as being something that's delivered and we always think about education as an engagement potential and we think about ICT as an extension of that engagement potential both with our students and between our students. I don't think I'll patent or copyright that notion so feel free to use the PC squared model but please do think about the, its potential. Let's um, now just change tack slightly and move away from some of the positivity and just remind ourselves that a tell endeavour is not without challenges. I think it's foolish to suggest that this is an easy path to lead. It clearly is not, as I suspect everybody in this room can um, subscribe to. So it is not without its challenges. So I've been teaching 16 years. I know it's important for me to stop from time to time. So here's just an opportunity for you now for two minutes. It's with your neighbour, what do you see as the biggest challenge to ensure an excellent tele experience is reported by all of your students? And not just the lucky few that are sat in that room over there and taught by somebody but all of your students in your universities and in your colleges. So what do you see as the biggest challenges? Just share them with your neighbour for two minutes. Okay, that, that I know was a very short two minutes, but, I, but, but, I, but I, thought it, I thought it appropriate just to pause and give you an opportunity either to connect with your neighbour, perhaps to talk about the meal last night, or actually to think, is, what is this guy saying, how does it make sense to me, and actually these are the specific challenges that I am facing, or these are the specific challenges that my programme team are facing. Or these are the specific challenges that I think us, either as an institution or as an academy, are facing. So I think if we, if we go into this naively, then we're missing opportunities to make a really good job of it. So who wants to give me their first challenge? I'm not going to go around the whole room. You don't need to worry about that. Yes, sir. The biggest challenge is the teacher's health. Because he's not uh, having the proper attitude to adapt. Uh, to the technology-based environment. That's what I consider as the biggest challenge in terms of his skill or in terms of his aptitude, whatever, resistance to change by the teacher. So, so I, think, I think you're absolutely right, and that's, been, and that's been one of my, I think, overriding observations, that the biggest challenge, no matter what we are seeking to do as an academy and no matter what we are, I guess, envisioned by our vice chancellors around in terms of the direction the biggest challenge the observation was made was around our faculty members and either helping them getting them inculcated into technology enhanced learning their motivation or just I, I guess their in some cases lack of interest but needing support in other cases lack of interest that's a really nice example one here yeah uh, lack of appreciation uh, of these activities by 
most faculty members. This was given as a suggestion that most people, most uh, faculty members, because the students are ready to accept these, but teachers take a lot more time. And uh, this brings down the overall level and makes it difficult for people who are, of course, they have to work harder and raise the level, but that's one of the challenges. Okay, so again, coming back, coming back with, with, with staff members that actually the convincing other staff that it's in their benefit to do it, it's not going to overwhelm them, and I guess, again, coming back to offering them some support. And so I absolutely think you're right that we need to work harder with staff. Maybe just one more and then I'll march on. Who's pressing to tell me their challenge? Um, oh gosh, gosh, gosh! Let's have someone we've not heard from. Is that is that okay? I hope that's okay. I'm sorry that I'm sorry that I'm dodging people. Anoop, I'm sorry that I'm dodging you and going over you. So, just at the back, sir. That's you, sir. Yes, turning around. Yeah, the students are uh, still used to blackboard teaching, and they find it much more convenient. This is one thing. And secondly, uh, uh, the elder teachers, they find it difficult to use technology. So. Uh, that's, in fact, a great challenge which we face, actually. Uh, the students, students, they find Blackboard teaching still convenient. Still, still convenient. Okay. And did you say older faculty members? Uh, yes. You said older yes. faculty members. Okay. Yeah. So let me take both of them. I'll be, I'll be more ruthless on the second and a little more gentle okay. on the first. How about that? Let's, let's, let's start at the beginning. Actually, I, I have a sense that I agree with you that our students, in many cases, they prefer what they have been exposed to. And I suspect their exposure to date has been much around chalk and talk. I talk, you listen. I write, you copy. I ask, you answer. So if that's their model of education, they may not know too much different from that. So I think it's our job as educators to say, this is my understanding of good education. Here's my evidence for my understanding of good education. And I'm going to do things with you as my students. I'm going to engage you in ways in which you might feel uncomfortable about. But you need to trust me. I've been teaching for 20, 30, 40 years. This is my evidence base and I am here to help you. So just as we need to support faculty members, I think we need to support our students in telling them why we are doing what we are doing. So I think, again, it's that, that wonderfully secretive nature of higher education. We just get on with our business and forgot, forget to take people with us. The second thing about elder faculty members, I'm not sure I agree. I have seen some wonderfully engaged members of faculty that are coming back on a part-time basis and have retired or are retirement age that are utterly engaged in technology enhanced learning. And I've also seen some younger members of staff that think that chalk and talk is the best way to educate students. So I think it's, an, for me, I think it's forgive me, a little bit of an over-characterisation. I think we need to work with staff that are new to the academy, and I think we need to work with staff that are experienced in the academy. But I don't actually believe it's an age thing. I don't believe that. Am I, am I wrong? Perfectly per per I'm happy to accept perfectly right. That works for me. Thank you, ver thank you very much. But I, but I think it's really useful to air that question. So thank you. So I'm so... I, I, again, forgive me, colleagues, for Pro Prof and Anoop, for... Um, going over your head, I, I just thought we'd engage some others. Um, I, I can only start the conversations, I can't finish with them. Feel free to continue those conversations over lunch, of course. Some other things that we might need to do, here's something that came into my Twitter stream from a conference. Um, someone was reminding of some work from Anissa Ramirez. Of course we need creativity and curiosity and problem solving. By the way, I think they've just defined an engineer there, haven't they? Yes, they have. But their closing point is that we need to make friends with failure. And I think that's actually fairly analogous to the question I was asked around students. We need to be comfortable being uncomfortable. And so as we engage in technology-enhanced learning, it is not without risk. And we should expect some failures on the way. So we need to expect that and make friends with failure. And 
as an underscore to some of this, we need not just to be looking at our smiling and happy graduates that are leaving our institutions and leaving the academy, but another tweet that came in from somebody that is of the age of our graduates said, writes, today's amazing technology is the worst technology their children will ever see. It is their Commodore 64. I think that's staggering, quite frankly, and I thought, I, I can't believe that. But take your minds back to when the first digital watch came out and how fascinated we were to press the button and get the lights going just as it was flipping over. What wonderful technology that was, and now look at what we have on our wrists. So the technology we have today, folks, is going to be so out of date. I mean, YouTube hasn't been around for that long. Facebook's just celebrated its 10th birthday. Who thought billions of people would be watching somebody dance to Gangnam Style that would connect to all of us? That's something that no one, none of us would have believed, I suspect. And the potential for those connectivities with technology-enhanced learning, we should tap into them. So, the underscore here, folks, is that when we talk about technology, we should not be talking about the stuff, but I think we should be talking about the affordances of technology and possibly thinking about principles and philosophies. For me, the biggest challenge is actually not motivating innovation. The biggest challenge is diffusing the innovation. And so, I work hard, and no doubt we all should work hard and keep asking ourselves, what are we doing or what can we do to help ensure any innovations that we see or any innovative behaviours impact more widely within our degree programmes, within our institution or indeed within the academy. The biggest challenge really is that diffusion of innovation and there's a lot written about that activity. I'll come back to my first two uh, questions that I was presented with around teachers because there is a risk here and the challenges are also associated with our faculty members too because quite frankly it is not an easy ride for teachers. When I joined the academy all I really thought was I needed to understand my subject. Actually, I was quickly disabused of that. I need also to understand what good education looks like. So I needed to be an ed engineering educator as well as an engineer. So we do need that subject knowledge and we do need that pedagogic knowledge. And when we bolt them together, we come up with this notion of the dual professional. And this was mentioned yesterday at one of the discussion sessions. That's probably good enough, or it was good enough 10 or 15 years ago. Unfortunately, we need to include technical knowledge in that well, in that um, domain as well. And I think when we bring them together, we probably have the ultimate teaching professional. I shouldn't say we're going to have the ultimate teaching professional because there's going to be a fourth in a few years' time. Horizon scanning's never been one of my great ventures. But I think those things are indeed what we need to be thinking of as we are working and supporting our faculty member. Knowing your subject in the 21st century is not good enough. You need to be a good educator and you need to understand the affordances of technology. Am I able to ask you to do one more thing after today? If I'm able to ask you to do one more thing, refresh your memory of the work of Lee Shulman and Mishra and Kola on their TPAC work. It describes beautifully that technological content and pedagogic knowledge and the different domains that might be helpful to frame perhaps some professional development for faculty members. So if great teachers need to have that TPAC, what's left for the rest of us? Well, I think there's 10 things we need to do to be expert in to make technology-enhanced learning happen. I won't read all of them out. You can read those 10 things yourself. Clearly it's being expert in cell. Clearly it's having an ability to create a vision. And it is really important as well to understand change management. <coughs> 
The rest of the 10 I'll leave behind. I've purposely left 10 blank because I wouldn't want to suggest I have all of the answers. You have your own 10th, by the way, but that allows that list to be constrained beautifully to 10. So there are a number of things that we need to do to make sure that TEL is pervasive in our institutions, and I think some of these are those things. And I've already worked through some of that today. It's important, of course, as we're engaging in this agenda, to think about the stakeholders, and the stakeholders start right at the prevailing priorities of the government, and they come right back through this mind map to students and faculty members. And I wouldn't want to trivialise the importance of working with every single member on that chart. And of course, it's just a single pathway. There are multiple pathways through. So we need to work with our students and faculty. We need to have a philosophy around the degree programme and the department and the school and the institution. And there's a number of things that we need to do in terms of engaging with them. Can I ask you to do one more thing? Have I been terribly, terribly greedy? I probably have. How will you ensure your learning you've gleaned from yesterday and hopefully from the rest of today will positively impact on your network and your stakeholders? Learning's brilliant and it's very personalised and I've got some stuff I definitely have with me. I've learnt lots in this day. But that would be quite single-minded if I didn't take an opportunity to share that for greater benefit. So let me encourage you to do the same. I'll just close very, very briefly with my journey here. Um, I know a couple of you know about my journey here, but I'll just close briefly with my journey here. I am mindful of the time, but just a couple of more minutes if you'll give me that luxury, please, Professor. Um, my journey here started out with a very encouraging and flattering letter from Manjula Rao from the British Council asking me to come to this event and describing what you are trying to do. I was terribly excited, I was flattered, and I was expecting and, and indeed have had much hope out of today. I needed to do a lot of preparatory work before I came here. I needed to understand what medical needs I would need. I needed to get a visa. I needed people to work for me to organise my travel arrangements. I engaged other people before I came here. I got a I got a, a car ride to the airport. I had to say goodbye and leave people behind that, quite frankly, I didn't want to say goodbye to, but I did. I was greeted with some unfortunate news about a, a plane delay, two-hour delay. So I was given some lousy news that just made me to rethink what I was going to do. I took the opportunity to do something different while I was waiting. Because of the delay, I was stuck at Dubai Airport for a, a too many hours, quite frankly, yeah. that, that I can remember. I was treated not as I would have expected and I was introduced to ways of working that were very different from mine. I wasn't fed, I wasn't watered, I was standing in a queue for a very long time. I took the opportunity to talk with people that I didn't know beforehand and learn some things from them and they kept me going and kept me motivated. And eventually I got here and was greeted and was rested and were re-energised. That was my story how I got here. It started with that hope and excitement and it had a number of things that I've described here. Ultimately, and my penultimate punchline is it is a journey worth doing. So again, thank you very much for your very generous invitation and for sharing your learning with me. But that's not my punchline, folks. My punchline genuinely is the journey I've described very rapidly and listed here is actually the same journey you are on with technology enhanced learning. Those things that I've put up there will resonate with you as you think about moving technology enhanced learning on. It will be full of excitement. You'll be asked to pause. You'll meet people along the way you didn't know. You may have to leave people behind. I'll leave that with you. Thank you very much for your attention and for allowing me to present. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Russell. It's indeed one of the most amazing talks. I have one page full of notes. And uh, I learned a lot during this talk, I must admit. Especially to all of us, 
the brave and bold venture that India is embarking upon is not without challenges. And he has listed some. And curiously, I have always known, for example, that a teacher teaching in the normal style does not necessarily amount to learning by students. But I did not realize in some simple words what I have been doing for 40 years. I talk, you listen. I write, you copy. I ask, you answer. <coughs> I think that describes the current teaching. Wonderful Professor Russell. Let's give him a big hand for his beautiful keynote. It is my pleasure to invite Professor Ashok Junjunwala from IIT Madras to deliver his talk. Again, those of you who are from India, of course, know about him. But for my other friends, I would just mention that like many of us, he has been an accomplished teacher, but he is better known for his extraordinary penchant for innovation, both in technology and teaching. Uh, recognizing his contributions, many, many years ago, Government of India conferred on him the fourth highest civilian award of Padma Sri, and that tells everything. He has been recently engaged in defining a model for quality enhancement in colleges other than IITs and NITs. And that's a model which will roll out in some 500 colleges, beginning with some 100 colleges. It's a very exciting opportunity for all of us to participate in that venture. And of course, most of these colleges, which are necessarily engineering colleges, because that is what we all look at, belong to several state technical universities. And that is where we believe that all of us would benefit from his exposition. So, Professor Junjunwala, all yours. Thank you very much. First of all, um, to understand the state of education in India, there are some very, very simple questions. Of course, most of the audience here is probably very knowledgeable. But I'll ask, start by asking a question that, uh, do you know what percentage of Indian children, when they attain age of six, today go to school? Can someone tell me? I know the ministry officials will know. But uh, can someone can guess what percentage of Indian children, when they attain the age of six, enter school? Get. OK, so that's good. So the, 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 I'm uh, talking to a very educated audience. Because if you go and ask in anywhere, in any place, they will say 60. Some will say 50. And the reason is that I remember, uh, somewhere in 80s, the number was closer to 40. So from there, we have very quickly expanded. And today, it is believed to be 96%. There is varying between 96% and 97%. Now, this is not just in school education. Take engineering education. When I joined IIT Madras in 1981, uh, as a young faculty, lots of parents used to bring their children to me and sort of say, I want my child to become an engineer. See, my daughter is so bright, she would really benefit by getting into engineering. But she just cannot get in. And I examined the number of seats that we had for engineering. We had 20,000 seats per year. And um, today it is 1.7 million. Not all of them are getting filled. And it is not about the school education or engineering education. You can ask for, look for MBA or look for pharmacy, look for pra practically any professional course other than medical. And you see huge, huge expansion has taken place in terms of quantity. So the point that I'm trying to make is that one thing that we have achieved in India is quantity. Now, that's not the only thing, but I think it's a major thing to, to have because where we used to deny most of the children education opportunity, at least we are able to get them to now schools and colleges. And along with such large uh, expansion in quantity comes equity. Today, I mean, it is very common practice. In fact, I don't have the actual number. Somebody from MHRD should sometime figure out the number, but it's estimated that about 25% of, of children in engineering schools are come from below poverty line, and 25% from 
uh, rural areas. So the second major gain has been in terms of equity. So we seem to have get, got two major gains. We don't talk about it. We don't celebrate it. Any gains should be celebrated. We often don't talk about We actually only talk about our shortcoming. And there is very serious shortcoming. Of course, the shortcoming is in terms of quality. And the quality has gone uh, particularly in fast expansion. The quality further deteriorates. And we have a serious problem of quality. Whether it's engineering education or whether it's a school education, everywhere there is a serious quality problem. Problem is that we, in the last 10, 15 years, when you are growing 50 times or 100 times, you can't even have so many teachers. So you have just brought somebody and made them teachers. Not even necessarily. Uh, so the, we, earlier we had a very, very exclusive education where there were some very good teachers and some limited number of good students and we used to call, celebrate that as a quality but frankly speaking that's really not a celebration at all so i think the key issue for us going beyond all the different things is that how do we fix the quality and we see ict as an important tool to fix the quality that's that's what it is we see that as an important tool huh? we are not saying it's the end and all it's a important tool in our pursuit of quality. So lack of quality is what we are really trying to overcome and seeing what extent ICT will help us. We do not know the answer. But I think enough has been done everywhere to kind of believe that yes, somewhere it is important. We don't have the clear answer. That what works, what does not work. When he talks about how does a last person or everyone really get benefit we don't even have answers. But I'm, I'm sort of saying that if the quality is here, can we start improving it? And I think it is in this context, there was a committee that was set up. Uh, the and th there has been, of course, a lot of things going on, which I think all of you know. So I'll not talk about it. So uh, uh, in India itself, there has been a number of efforts. I mean, for example, NP10 was a great example. Large number of IIT lectures being put together in top class lectures. Uh, we went around various NITs to talk to students. What, how do, have they, how do they view NPTEL? And we invariably found, found that top two to three percent of the students have really liked NPTEL and have leveraged NPTEL. The remaining to a very limited extent. Occasionally, they have used it. Most of them have not used it. So we have got some very good, which motivated students, highly motivated students, can find ways. And we have created content for uh, like NPTEL content. A number of other experiments have been there. Uptake has been less than desirable. And as a result, all the attempts that we have been making has had only limited success. It is in this context that MHRD set up a committee. I happen to be the chairman of a committee to sort of say, take 500 engineering colleges other than IITs and NITs and fix quality. Do whatever is required. Fix quality. And no, we don't expect it in a year, but have a 10-year program. Fix quality. And if we can do it for 500 engineering colleges, maybe we can expand it to 2,000. Maybe we, there will be learning from there for other disciplines. Maybe there will not be learning. I'm not saying everything will be usable. And do sufficient experimentation. My MHRD uh, additional secretary actually taught me a word uh, called action research. That go and try. Get things tried out. Continuously take feedback. See what works, what doesn't work. If it's something works to a limited extent, that's good. Then see how rest can be actually taken up. And that is what the committee has been trying to do. In fact, several people out here are members of the committee. And the committee has been, for last nine to 10 months, has been working to try to figure out what can be done. We clearly recognize that we need to do three different things. One is 
can we do something direct to student? Where can we directly get some programs to the student? Like where, say, the MOOCs does it. But let's, let's try to figure out what can be taken directly to the students. But we very clearly recognize that, unlike some people who believe, oh, now the days of universities are over and you just can directly teach students, we believe that that can have a limited impact at best. Huh? The rest has to be done. The rest has to be done elsewhere. So we sort of said, well, strengthen the teachers. Strengthen the existing teacher and bring in quality teachers. For example, a very, very simple thing that we kind of try to figure out uh, is that is the top 15% or top 20% of students in engineering, graduating students in engineering, taking up teaching career. We're asking uh, whether the teachers, do they belong to the top 15 to 20%? If they belong to top 15 to 20%, they basically, irrespective of where they are coming from, they basically have the quality. And we haven't done any great survey, but even a limited extent that we found, no, no longer that is so. The top 35, 40% no longer come to the teaching. Now, if top 35, 40% do not come to the teaching, there is a serious problem. Now, I remember this issue used to be raised in our early part of this century that, well, part of the reason why this is not done is because the teaching is a very poor career, doesn't pay enough. And in India, therefore, one of the major things that was done in the last pay commission was very significant increase in salaries for the teachers. And I know it took four years, and I remember as a member of Prime Minister's Scientific Advisory Committee, we actually spent an hour and a half with the Prime Minister on this particular issue. We say you cannot fix it unless you are able to attract high quality teachers. And for that, you need to fix. And we say, okay, for teachers, I'll have a special pay commission. And in fact, the, I think while one can still continue to complain and um, um, there is no amount of money can be enough, but certainly it is not as unattractive. I know, remember that my own salary almost overnight increased by four times as a faculty member. It shocked actually when it came. Hmm? Huh? Very pleasantly. In fact, uh, 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 I mean, people like me don't even know what to do with that. But that's a different issue. But huh? uh, many of youngsters sort of say, "No, no, you have settled for too little." But maybe we come from different generation. But can we get the top 15% of the stu teach students to become teachers? And can we take the existing teachers and strengthen them? And an excellent, I'm not going to talk much about it because there is excellent work that is the, being done at IIT Bombay hmm, on training the teachers. And we found that they have actually gone far ahead than pretty much anywhere or thing else that we have seen. So we pretty much sort of say that's a model. We may fine tune it, we may continue to get feedback. That's a, the that's a model that we do. The third important thing we sort of say we need to do is really look at the whole governance issue. The governance issue, regulations, the issue of uh, uh, re autonomy, rating, hmm? and unless we fix that and even make the economic model work, because if we don't make the economic model work, one of the things that was pointed out by some people sort of saying that, well, you can't charge the students enough fee and can't pay the teachers enough money. So if that happens, then so unless money comes from somewhere else, the whole thing will falter or the student-teacher ratio will go vary. So can, what can you actually do? So these are three buckets in which we are working. What I'm going to present to you is very, very briefly the first bucket, direct to student. What did we look at in terms of direct to student? The idea is we sort of said, well, we will try everything that is available. We'll try, try everything. Take 100 colleges to begin with and then increase it to 500 colleges and try out. See then what works, what doesn't work. See what gives positive results, what does not. What enthuse students, what does not. And we sort of said, we'll try live classes. Live classes, we sort of said, that we'll put the best teachers in front of students. The very best teachers. So we went to the four IITs, IIT Madras, Bombay, uh, Delhi, and Kanpur. And we asked the director to give us the teacher rating of their uh, of last three years. 
And we found that the some teachers were consistently in the top five or ten within IITs for three consecutive years. So we sort of say, pick them up, get them to try to teach. Because let's say with the best teachers, does it really have a good impact? Hmm? And the live classes is actually a live class hmm? in any subject. We define the subject, and we sort of say in this subject there is a live class going on. The students, instead of for local teacher teaching it, is now being taught by re remotely, simultaneously teaching to ten thousand students. Almost not right now. It is being done. Well, yeah, it is uh, six seven thousand students. Six seven thousand students. There is some interaction, limited interaction. You know, we use all the other technology things, and we try to actually do that. And fortunately, I'll tell you a little bit more about it. We got we're getting very very good response. Because what the students actually keep on telling us that the, a top quality teacher, we do not see a top quality teacher. Most of the students in mean many of the engineering college say, I go through the whole four years and do not see one teacher which is a top quality. Not just in top quality in teaching, but also somebody who can inspire. So we are looking at somebody who can inspire besides being the top quality teacher. And can they do life class? But we clear right in the beginning sort of said, well, that does not mean that we will try to disempower the local teacher. So we said only one third of the course is going to be taught by this life classes. Two thirds will be taught by the local teacher. Maybe the local teacher, and the local teacher has to also attend the class. And it will be in a classroom. It will not be in your homes. Huh? So in a normal discipline manner, the local teacher may, themselves can gain out of this. And this has been one of the things that is going on. And this is the only thing that has actually gone on for now about one month, a little more than a month. And I've seen very, very positive results. But again, very early. So I don't want to sort of say that, yes, uh, um, everything is working great. Then we sort of say tutorials. We are, the second thing that we learned, at least at IIT, when we were ourselves students, and now when we are teaching, that what the major part of learning also takes place in tutorials. Where tutorial sheet is given, and a small group, 20, 30 students, is held by a tutor uh, in solving the problem. Hmm? And we cre recreated the same situation, except a virtual tutorial. We get some of the best students to now try to train, remotely connect, simultaneously to 30. They are sitting in a class, and the tutorial problems are getting solved. The third thing that we do is virtual labs. There are already a lot of work going on. Actually, NPTEL program had actually created a lot of things. We started sort of saying, how can we leverage some of these things? So can we create these remote labs, where the equipment may be sitting elsewhere, but you get very, very good front end and all that, and you are able to connect to the labs and carry out the experiment. The fourth, we sort of say, we'll try out all kinds of MOOCs that are available. We were sort of said, well, MIT has top quality MOOCs. So one of the course from there we picked up and said, let students register for it. Then there was another MOOCs that was done by Microsoft Research, which was actually implemented in Karnataka colleges and got very positive responses. So we'll try that out. And in the third MOOCs that the NPTEL uh, team, along with NASCOM, is trying to bring it, we say, whenever it is ready, we'll try that out. Some of them it will work, some of that will not work. And to what extent each will work, we'll figure out. And then we sort of say we'll have bridge courses. What are the bridge courses? Bridge courses are non-curriculum courses, which are essentially useful to the students when they go to the industry. And we'll say we'll introduce some bridge courses. So this is what we try to, we are in fact actually try to do the bridge courses along with um, uh, British Council. We had actually decided one of the English learning course. But unfortunately, the British Council came and sort of said, yes, yes, they had agreed to everything, but they cannot let the content be put on our server. And we said, well, the kind of bandwidth, et cetera, that we have, we are all NK and connected. There is no way we can manage it without that. And therefore, we had to drop it. But we are doing some other things. So today, the live classes are going on with 100 colleges and tutorial, as I pointed out, virtual labs, MOOC, and some bridge courses. And we, we are using leveraging NKN. Great network has some problems. We need to fix that. We need to fix that. We need to also, have been, I've been telling them that we also need a high quality broadcast, at least one way. The second way can actually continue to come. So that also we have been talking about. And we have today classes going on. We have Professor Jagannathan from IIT Kanpur teaching on Monday, every Monday, 8 to 9. 9 to 10 is being Professor Neela Nataraj, IIT Bombay. They're all different courses and to different classes, linear algebra. 
Huh? And a heat transfer course is being taught by, from IIT Madras. And this we are currently doing, putting the best teachers first time in front of for the students. Um, for teachers, initially we had to a little bit push them. Today they are really thrilled. Say, I'm teaching 7,000 students. It's a different experience. And they say enough questions are asked. Yes, this is the beginning. We'd like to do more. So uh, enough courses are asked. And so that, that's why. And this is one of the Aditya Jagannathan. Is, is that correct? Aditya Jagannathan. Anyone remembers him? I.D. Kanpur. I think he's from Aditya Jagannathan. This is another <coughs> faculty member. I think he's Balaji, from what I remember. Now, one of the first feedback that we got very early to get feedback is that the students liked the courses where they, it was taught on Blackboard the most. And we had difficulty initially. On the blackboard, you did not get the same quality. And then Kamal, he's here, I saw him, Bijlani, he helped us fix this kind of thing. And today, we are actually are able to get as good a quality on blackboard. They just feel that it's more interactive. Now, I'm therefore not saying that's the only way. There are multiple ways, but different teachers are encouraged to try different things. The same course being taught by this. Um, today, I won't say that we have the best, as he pointed out, that 20 years down the line, we will sort of say we are working with Commodore 64. Exactly, that's the way we'll feel. But that's fine. Now we will start with that. We'll keep on progressing. Today, we have two screens in every of these 100 colleges broadcasted. On one is the faculty member. Another is the blackboard or the content. And there is live interaction. There is a complete framework where uh, all the colleges which are logged on are known. And uh, you can raise hands and do all those things has actually been done. And fortunately, there are enough people who have worked on technology. I mean, the, I mean I'll sort of say that that kind of thing has actually happened. And this is another course where students are kind of sitting, sometimes somewhat sleeping. And we are all watching who sleep, what is happening. That's a, that shows us. Overall, what, what are the early feedbacks? Now, they are very early feedback. Overall, transmission and technical content are really nice and helpful to students as well as the faculty members. Overall, audio video quality is excellent. We are opting for the 12 live classes and have registered 700 students. Its experience is excellent. Audio and video quality is good without any lag. Students are very interested to attend the classes as fundamentals are taken. Now, this is, huh? but there are some negative points. We have been repeatedly told that noiseless echo canks. Uh, less interactions should be actually done. Occasionally, we do find echoes and things like that. I think these are early days. This is the first time this is being tried out. Uh, there are, what I have not put out here, there are glitches that we occasionally find in NKN. A minute, two minute glitches are very off common. Three days back, the NKN suddenly, for one hour, was totally flooded hmm? and created a problem. So remember that we are broadcasting to 100 colleges. We need closer to 40 megabit per second bandwidth, dedicated bandwidth, and became a big problem. There are variations in syllabus offered at IIT compared to the university, but uh, basics are anyway covered. Then we went into tut live tutorials. As I pointed out, tutorials is actually happening where a tutor is connected to the students. They can put whatever material. They can put video material, written material, question answers, and that's another thing. Our, we, we have started only about a week back, 10 days back. Our feedback yet from tutorials is not very strong. It's something that we really need to worry about. Huh? Then we have these labs. I, for example, we have this DSP cloud that was developed at my place. By the way, what we decided is the best way to do it. Even at IIT Madras, the regular labs are done. But they are also done in the same mode now. They are no longer done by students going and connecting to each board. They are just logging on to that. They use the same e-books. They use the same kind of, because every lab, there is a background theory that is faculty member, uh, there is a video by a faculty member. There is a, um, for every uh, experiment, what is the objective of the experiment is described by a graduate student by on a video. Students read, and we have tried, started to try that. And I will sort of say it's very early. Um, I don't expect everything to work. I expect lots of problems. Uh, but my feeling is that we should, between what we are trying to do, what IIT Bombay has already done for a year and a half, two years, probably longer period of time, some others are doing IIT Kharagpur, et cetera. I think we just need to learn. 
I think two, three years we will be able to start making some impact, already making some impact. I'm not trying to say, huh? and I, my own feeling is India being a peculiar problem where we have 1.5 million engineering students. Most of them, you go beyond the top 50 colleges, the quality becomes very poor. We really need to fix the quality and I think we will certainly gain. We'll continue to learn from whatever else happens anywhere else. But uh, one thing that I want to warn, since there are people from outside, uh, often we have heard people coming and sort of saying, Google comes and presents, ah, we have a solution, this is going to solve all the problems. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes somebody from MIT also will come and sort of say, we know exactly what has to be done. And unfortunately, what we very quickly find, they don't know. Things may work in certain environments, in certain situations. I think we need to be very, very careful that we will probably see more failures than success. And when we recognize and accept that 75% of things may fail, 80% of things may fail, but the 20% that will succeed, we will multiply that and keep on gaining, we will gain. Thank you very much. That's it.